Oh, hey, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to the Efficiency Bitch Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Leone. This podcast is dedicated to all the women out there who are aspiring to have a career while raising a family. And bitch? Well, that's more than a name and even an attitude. (laughs) We use it as an acronym. It's for bank, inbox, time, connection, and harmony. Each episode is labeled according to the correct topic so that you can efficiently find the topic that you're looking for. I'm here to tell you, you can have your cake and eat it too. The trick is finding efficient ways to get through the have-tos so that you can make room for your best life. I can show you how. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Efficiency Bitch Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Leone. If this is your first time here, welcome to the Beehive. I'm so glad you came. If you've been around a while, welcome back. I think you're really going to enjoy today's episode. So today is all about C for connection. And it's a huge part of the message I want to bring for efficiency in the world. The way we talk to people really helps improve our efficiency and the the quality of our relationships. And so I have a wonderful guest here today. Erica Ng is going to be here to talk to us about communication and the way it impacts our lives. Hi, Erica. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here. So I was recently a guest on Erica's podcast, which is self-help junkie, right? And we had such an awesome conversation. I asked her to come on EB podcast and talk to us a little bit about all of her expertise. So Erica, why don't you start with who you are, where you come from and how you do life? Sure. So I'm from Vancouver, Canada, but I haven't actually lived there in over nine years. After I graduated in college, I went over to South Korea to go teach for a year. And it turns out I loved it. During high school, I always said I would never teach because of how terrible we were to the teachers but it brought me a lot of joy. And I realized how much I loved interacting with people and helping other people grow. Um, I then went on to go to Vietnam where I was a manager. And that was also just a whole new world working in a startup uh, and just being able to help build an entire company um, from scratch. A lot of mistakes being made, but also really fun. And now I live in Indonesia and I've started my own business called Better Said, where I do communication coaching. I basically have taken a lot of what I've learned from my travels abroad, and I bring that back to people in international companies. So um, especially people who have Asian backgrounds and are working in these international companies, the culture is different and we've been taught something completely different. So I help them overcome communication barriers that come with that cultural barrier. That's awesome. And it's so relevant, I think, to all points in history, but it feels very relevant right now, too. There are so many things that people feel or want to say. And if you don't say it in a way the other person can hear you, you just come across as combative, right? And it's not that your ideas are wrong or that theirs are, but if you say it in, in a way that is that the other person can't hear you, then the communication failed. So I love, um, I love this topic. So the way we communicate impacts our ability to be understood and understand others. Are there any common mistakes or pitfalls to avoid when trying to improve communication? I think that you can split these into two different camps. There are the people who are the talkers. And for those people, the advice would be to listen more. I think this was something that I struggled with before. Um, I'm always thinking about what am I going to say next? Oh, I need to remember this thing. And I'm so busy thinking about what I want to say next that I'm not listening to the other person. Um, So I've gotten to the point where I just let things go. If I can't remember at the end of their sentence, just, just, it's okay. (laughs) Just listen. And if there's something else that comes up that actually flows better, go with that instead. It's funny. Um, It's an interesting tactic that even as a podcast host, you and I both have to, to manage, right? Because you have to listen, but you also have to have questions that are coming up next, yes. right? And I think politicians do it quite well and, and attorneys as well. It's something that you learn in in the courses of debate or of communication, right? That you have to listen for the other person's prompts. So you can't be thinking so much about what you have to say next. You have yeah. to be actively listening. So yeah. that is a difficult one to master. 
One of the good things about being the podcast editor as well, though, is if there <laughs> is a pause, it's okay. Just cut it. And if, if they're, if they want to like keep going, I can edit it later if it's a little too long. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And yeah. what about for those who don't want to speak? Yes. Yes, like for to. the people who are the listeners and maybe are a little bit shy, a, a lot of the time, so I have a lot of clients in this category, they think that they're boring and mm-hmm. they're, it comes from low self-worth um, or they're concerned about looking smart or being right or hurting other people's feelings. And I think that when it comes to communication, you have to have a core goal right? Whether that be improving the relationship, setting your boundaries, or just showing up and having a good time. If you can keep that core message, I think that it makes it much easier to join in on the conversation. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be as much of a talker as someone else, but you can at least contribute and feel like you are contributing to the conversation. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of that can come from childhood and how you experience school and education, right? If you were sure. too talkative in school, you may ha- grow up to have a little reservation to raising your hand in the workplace and having those types of instincts quashed as a child. I was not a talker in school at all. Yeah. I usually kept my mouth shut, but now I talk nonstop. <laughs> I was kind of split. During class, completely silent, but when I'm with my friends and I'm feeling comfortable, no Mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. So it's taken some getting used to uh, talking in front of people who are older than me, people who I was training, but like had 30 years on me. Um, So yeah, that's been an interesting change. Yeah. It's interesting. You bring that up. My first job in life was as a bank teller at age 16. Mm. And I think that really helped me develop confidence talking to people older than me. Cause I was younger than everybody all the time. <laughs> right. And I had to talk about something very sensitive and very personal being their money. And I think that really did increase my confidence as I grew. And it's interesting like public speaking now is something I really enjoy. I, I mm. love to be on stage, but I do not enjoy network groups. Like oh. there's a lot of them around me, like come to these mom groups, come to these pr- small business owner groups and you network with folks. And I don't feel comfortable in like happy hour with a bunch of strangers. That is super uncomfortable for me, but put me on stage and I'm super happy. Right. But for curious. other people, it's the exact opposite. They hate um, the idea of being on stage, but are good with the small talk. <laughs> I'm curious about the small talk. What makes you feel nervous or uneasy in this I situation? I think because I like to talk about things that make other people uncomfortable. I like to talk about ah. politics. I like to talk about money. I like to have conversations that are, I mean, that's part of why I started a podcast because I wanted to have conversations with people who wanted to have conversations about <laughs> complicated and interesting things. Um, but most of the time, the things that interest me are taboo topics. Yeah. They're just a little (laughs) difficult to have in social situations. Um, and you know, being a working mom, like I talk about my kids or I talk about work. And those are typically the things that you do in social situations. And I don't always want to talk about those things, but I don't know. I find it super fascinating because there are some people who just love to stand around and talk about you know, the small, the, the weather or right. what, you know, whatever they did for the weekend, for whatever reason, those things make me really nervous. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I think if you're not in it and it's not something that you're excited to talk about, you're going to get a little bit nervous, you know, and I, I quit drinking three and a half years ago. And I think that also plays a, a component in that because it's often surrounded up alcohol is often the center point of those types Mm -hmm. of networking events. Like it's a happy hour, it's one o'clock or whatever, because I don't partake. That also increases my anxiety around why aren't you drinking, Melissa? Are you pregnant? Are you (laughs) like, what are the things? What are the reasons? It's funny how those different events in your life can really impact the way you feel comfortable communicating um, and don't feel comfortable communicating. Yeah. It's interesting because here in Bali, I also stopped drinking for a while and people are so accepting of it here. Mm. You don't want to drink. Okay, cool. Do you want a water instead? And I don't think I would have been able to do that. Were I in those situations just because of the social pressure? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very real. It's very 
um, why aren't you drinking? You know what? Why? It's the people one drug why. in life where people are like, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> I know it's so strange. In fact, I have a guest coming on to record tomorrow and we are talking about sober curious and she runs a whole coaching system for women who are, who are interested in, um, not drinking. And I did it, you know, by, by myself three and a half years ago. And, and I don't regret a moment of it, but it, mm-hmm. it does still have some social, um, implications, I guess, to, to those pieces. It's, it's tricky. So, okay. Let's talk about how can somebody effectively express themselves or their thoughts without creating misunderstandings or without creating conflicts? Oh, I don't know if you can. I think that misunderstandings and conflict will happen. That is just part of the risk. I think the people that you want to keep around you are the ones who will be forgiving of those situations and give you grace just as you hopefully would give grace to those people around you. Um, I'm big on giving context when it comes to sharing information. I think a lot of times we have our own narratives that we are going through life with because we all have our own experiences that no one else gets to see. And if you don't give context to the other person you're speaking to, it's so easy to feel like they're wronging you, that they're doing something out of malice when it's usually ignorance. Um, I have a little tool that I use both in professional and personal life to give feedback. Um, And basically there's five steps. First, we start off with context, just giving some background information of how you saw what happened, your actual observations. This is where people say, don't use you use I statements instead. So like I observed this and this, and then you can attach your feelings to it. So I felt this when this happened. Um, And then going into the value in the future, why is this important to you? And what would you like to see in the future? I think so often we want our boyfriends or our friends to do something differently, but if we don't tell them exactly what we want them to do, how are they supposed to guess? How are they supposed to read our minds? Yeah, it's so true. The why is so critical because mm. without it, it feels like an order versus a request, right? right? And like this example just played out in my life yesterday. I live in Arizona and I was swimming with my kids and my dog loves to swim, loves it. And he's difficult to swim with because the dog paddle it can be kind of... <laughs> it hurts, right? If he gets near you and his swimming is scratching you because he wants to be near you, but he's also moving his legs. And so my son, he's eight was shoving water at him, like trying to keep him from scratching him. And I said, Jake, don't do that. And he kept doing it in a different way, but he was still doing it. And it wasn't until I stopped him and said, you can drown him. He can't breathe the same way Mm -hmm. you can. And Jake was like, Oh, why didn't you say that? Like he didn't know (laughs) why I was saying not to do that. He just knew he didn't want the dog near him and splashing and kept him away. But it wasn't until I said, put your hand out, like touch his chest. So he can't get that close to you. So just just interesting little things that play out like that. Right. Like my son wasn't trying to hurt the dog. He was trying not to get hurt himself, but without the why he didn't understand why I was telling him not to do that. And I think those things play out all the time from Mm -hmm. why a chore needs to be done with your partner, why you said something at work the way that you did, why your boss asked you for something, why you asked your subordinate to do something. Um, Those things are super critical in communicating. And it happens so much more often when it's cross-cultural because you don't have that base understanding. Um, There was this one time when I was working in Vietnam, I had an assistant who would book our business trips for us. So I knew I had a business trip two weeks ahead of time, I sent her the itinerary of like, which hotel I wanted, which flights, sent it all to her. She's like, got it. I'll book it for you. I'm like, wonderful. Next day I check in, nothing. This goes on and on and on for the next two weeks until it's the day before I'm supposed to leave. I sat down with her. I'm like, I've checked in with you every single day. Why hasn't this been done? She's like, oh, well, I can just do it the day before I don't know what the big deal is. And I had to sit her down and say, well, I get anxious because I'm worried that I'll miss the flight. I'm worried that it'll get booked out. I'm afraid that I'll have to look for another hotel. So in the future, it would really help me out if you booked it as soon as I sent it over to you. So I no longer have to worry. 
And once we had that conversation, all clear, she understood yeah. what I, my expectations were and just, yeah, so much easier after that. Yeah. It's interesting, right? Like she didn't think she was blowing you off. She no. thought she was just going to do it before you needed it. Yeah. yeah. Those types of things are, they seem so obvious mm. to the, to one of us, <laughs> or right. maybe both of us. And then you flip it and you think, oh, they actually didn't, didn't know where I was going. The other right. thing I find really interesting is the way written communication ha- impacts us. So, mm. you know, talking about keyboard courage and the way people communicate online these days is, is so different, um, than it is when you're having the verbal conversation, the things that people are willing to write and the way that they write them can sound so accusatory, but if you heard them Mm -hmm. spoken, it wouldn't feel that way. And I've, since I wrote my book last year, well, even while I was in the book writing process, I guess is when I had this epiphany and I've said it a few times on this podcast, but it's the way that you hear something is different than the way that you read it. The inflection Mm. is different. The way that you take the accusations, so to speak, are different or the order versus request and learning to communicate in all ways, learning to hear it the way the person Mm -hmm. intended it, learning to say it in a way another person can receive it and learning to read and write with that same skill is so complicated. (laughs) For sure. For sure. And especially in the dating game, I have friends who are still out there looking for their partner and just the analysis that goes into where the period is placed. Why didn't they use an emoji here? Why did they use this emoji yes. instead of that one is never ending. Yeah. The, the emoji phenomenon is so interesting to me <laughs> because it was the attempt in, in, in all the right places to take shorthand, right? Like Mm -hmm. what we text and what we communicate on social media and put a little bit of inflection to it as if we were speaking. And sometimes it's perfect. And sometimes it just absolutely does not hit the mark. No, (laughs) but it's such a funny, I mean, you can have an entire conversation in emojis these days. So, I mean, every time there's an iOS update, there's like 500 more emojis that seem to come up. (laughs) I wonder who's sitting there designing them all being like, you know, what's missing in our vernacular right now, this emoji, like this is the (laughs) one that will change our lives. (laughs) There's a selfie one. Now there's like an arm holding a phone. Yeah. I I typed in selfie the other day to my sister or something and the little, you know, prompt came up with it, but we're definitely going back to hieroglyphics. It's funny. (laughs) Um, It's a funny evolutionary turn. I don't know. I, I love List, I, I read a lot of conversations that happen on my social media page. Um, I have two of them, obviously one for my business and one, and one for the podcast in the book. And it's interesting, the dialogue that can take place, right. And sure. culture plays so much into it. Um, language, if you're speaking in your first language or not, but it's so interesting the way that people can receive communication based Mm -hmm. on some of those factors, the period, the emoji, the comma, um, and really take some of those things literally or intentionally through, yeah, through something that probably didn't have much to it. (laughs) I mean, I think very often, especially reading things online conversations that are happening, people are coming into it with so much bias already. They're looking to get angry at something. And I, I've had, I've seen conversations where someone took the time to say like, Hey, that's not actually what I intended to mean. This is what I meant. And that's rare, but really beautiful when they take that time because the other person can then reflect on their own uh, communication and how they read into it. And hopefully that helps them be less angry (laughs) online, but yeah, just in general, I think we're in such a fast paced world where there's just constant need for communication that we don't slow down and think about, oh, how else could this be taken? Yeah, I agree. So can you give us some ideas on how we can foster a culture of open and honest communication, both professionally and personally? Right. I think the first is filling your cup, um, your emotional well-being dictates how you're going to show up in any conversation. So if you're drained, I don't think you're going to have the energy to be open and honest because that takes a lot of emotional work. Um, So I I do things like 
crochet and knit and spend time with friends. I actually have a spreadsheet where I track that to make sure I'm hitting certain things. I love that. Yeah. Almost um, every problem in life can be solved with a spreadsheet. I'm honestly, <laughs> I've been telling all of my friends, none of them listen. <laughs> True. I, I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. And then other things that you can do is when you're in a situation of conflict, weighing the benefits and the risks, if your priority is to keep the relationship because you know of all these indirect things that will happen in your life because of that, I'd say go for it. It's not anyone's place to choose except yours. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are also benefits to having that conversation. If you know that, hey, my personal well-being is what I'm putting ahead of your feelings right now. I think if you have your priorities in line and you know what you're about, it makes it so much easier to be open and honest with another person. Yeah, it's super true. I yeah. think there's so many opportunities that we have every day to improve our communication and it takes a little intention and hopefully sure. not a lot of emotional energy, but maybe right. it does to start and then it gets a little yeah. easier, like exercising a muscle. Yeah. I mean, I think also like with my relationship, I like to bring things up when we're both in happy places mm -hmm. and bring it up as hypotheticals, right? Like, Hey, what if a happened? what would we do about that? And then when the time comes, when we, uh, like when that situation actually happens, we may not act in the best way possible, but we can look back on it and be like, well, we had this conversation. How did we fall short? What stopped us from getting there? And I think that sets the groundwork, right? Just having those open and honest conversations when you're in a good place makes it so much easier when you're in a complex situation. Yeah, it's true. I've learned a couple of things about resolving relationships, personal relationships mm. in particular. Um, and there's three appropriate places that I have found in my life to have difficult conversations. One is while you're walking side by side, like oh. walking the dog has been a really helpful therapeutic place for us to have those conversations, um, with children in the car. Mm. And I don't know why, I don't know if it's they can't see your face directly, but I get more out of my kids while I'm driving. Um, and not like anger conversations, but like I, they confess <laughs> in the car. Um, and then if it's a particularly emotionally charged conversation, um, I like to go someplace public. So like if I have something really emotional, I need to talk to my partner about my spouse about we'll go to a restaurant and then neither of us will get loud or overly out of control because we're in a public place. And so you have mm. to, you naturally start to rein in the temper tantrum that you may have had if you'd had it on your, in your living room. Right. right. So, um, right. it's funny, those different places. And I just celebrated my 14th wedding anniversary last week and I did not learn all of those things, um, <laughs> in the early years. Well, I, right. I guess I'd learned them the hard way in the early years as well. <laughs> right, right, right. It's interesting. But, those first two that you had there, it's when the two people are facing the same direction, right? It's mm -hmm. less confrontational. Yeah. Um, I definitely have found that sitting side by side and holding hands, having some sort of personal contact makes it feel like you're part of a team rather than adversaries. Yeah. Yeah. It is an interesting, I never considered that we were in the car and walking facing the same direction versus towards each other. Cause you're right. Yeah. It is less let us less of a standoff than it is. Yeah. Uh, we're moving in the right direction. I and having a, having a shared activity, right? I think this is a tip for when you want to talk to your guy friends and you want to get something out of them, give them an activity, whether it's like bowling, playing pool, something to distract them. That way your mental energy is being spent on that. So emotional comes out easier as well. Yeah, that's a good point. It's definitely easier to have a conversation with my husband if he's, um, <laughs> bowling or shooting pool or right. walking the dog the dishes, like, doing something. Yeah. It's funny how those little things can really impact. All right. So I have one wrap up question for you mm -hmm. and I'm so interested in your take on the word bitch, um, being Canadian mm -hmm. and now living in Asia for as long <laughs> as you have, um, you may have a different take on it than an American would like myself. So when you hear the word bitch, what does it mean for you personally? And then how have you seen it play out in your travels internationally? Right. Well, 
I, the first time I was ever called a bitch has been imprinted on my mind. And it really affected me. It was when I was around 13 years old and I didn't do anything wrong looking back, but it really shook me to have someone say it with such vitriol hate. Mm -hmm. And I really questioned who I was and what kind of person I was in that moment. But I think over time, it has completely lost its meaning. It's not something that you hear often in Asia. Uh, you might hear kids say like, oh, the B word, but mm -hmm. it's not something that is as powerful. I think the most often I come across it now is on social media because I am still connected to Western uh, yeah. reels and posts and whatnot. And it's been interesting seeing it being reclaimed and being used as a term of endearment now more than anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's certainly how I use it. I mean, efficiency bitch together, those two words together was a love language yeah. of my mom and my sister and I, and you know, when I started writing the book, I had to really think hard about it. You know, mm -hmm. being a professional, being a mom, I have two daughters, one son, did I want to have something with that word on it? So, um, I did a lot of research and I ended up <laughs> with yes, but not everybody takes it, uh, the right, right the way that I intend it. So thank you for sharing that information. Yeah. And speaking of sharing, Erica, would you share with the audience where they can find you, how they can connect or continue the conversation? Sure. So if you're looking for my podcast, Self Help Junkie, that's everywhere as well as on Instagram. Um, my work Instagram is Erica with a K dot better said or better said dot org. Awesome. Erica, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It was really fun. And thank you so much for listening. If you've been around a while, thanks for coming back. If you're new here, make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss our next episode. Until next week, I'm Melissa Leung. See ya. Well, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for listening. If you're new around here, please be sure to leave us a review on any podcast platform you're listening to. And you can always reach out to me to let me know what topics you're interested in hearing about or maybe telling me someone you think would be great for the show. Either way, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at EfficiencyBee. Until next time, see ya!